Welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and this is episode 165. Uh, I have a lot to share with you today and I'm excited to be here. It is actually a little bit dark. Um, the sun is just peeking over the house next door to us so I'm hoping that um, we'll get to a, just another gorgeous day. So uh, for those who haven't maybe watched the podcast from the from the beginning, um, but some of you will, will know this, um, August and September are my absolute most favorite months of the year. I absolutely love them and um, a lot of it is because the weather that we get here on the in the Pacific Northwest is just perfect. So I'm really enjoying it. Uh, we've been outside um, a lot the last uh, few few weeks and as you guys know we were away for a little bit. Anyways, I've just been really enjoying this weather. It's kind of like um, sweatshirt and shorts, t-shirt in the morning kind of weather and then pull on a cardigan in the evening kind of weather, maybe jeans. So yeah. Oh, that's good, Kelly. Yeah. I, sometimes I think it looks a bit dark and then sometimes I'm like, no, that's actually kind of perfect. And it'll, the camera will adjust sort of as it feels it needs to. So in today's show, uh, we've got some breed and color studies to talk about. I'm really excited. I don't know if Tamara is here. I can't see her in the chat just yet, but I'm hoping that she's around. Um, and we've got a giveaway. Uh, we've got all of the Made With Love Along uh, prizes to give away. I talked to Rebecca this past week. We had a lovely catch up and um, it was so good to talk to her and to see her. So we've got those prizes and then we've got um, some works in progress as you can see in the camera. And uh, I just realized all of my sweater knits that I've been working on, I've left them in the other room. Um, so we'll see what time it is and whether or not I run and grab those or not. So um, actually maybe what, oh hi Tamar, maybe what I'll do is while the credits are running I will run and grab them. So without further ado let's get into the show. So I normally wouldn't run off, but <laughs> I knew exactly where my uh, my sweater knitting was. So I was like, run. Um, I had left them. We've got, uh, we're building. Um, so we've got a um, sort of a, we've got quite a small home and we like it that way. And um, on the peninsula side, so we've got this peninsula that comes out that sort of separates our breakfast nook from our kitchen. And on the side of the breakfast nook, the countertop kind of hangs over a little bit and all of my raw uncooked uh, bags of beans are under there and so what we're doing and there's a lovely set of bay windows right there that are quite small um, just sort of regular sized windows and we're actually going to build um, uh, box seating under there and my it'll become storage for all of my raw like all of my beans all my dried beans and um, the kids will and then the kids can sit up there and we'll paint them with waterproof paint and then we can just wipe it down if, if there's a spill or anything um, anyways it's kind of become like a on top of all the bags it's kind of become like this place that I can put my knitting bag it's not on the counter it's not on the kitchen table but I know where it is <laughs> random I know sorry um, all right, so we've got um, coming up in September, it, we've got our 51 yarn spin along for group A. You guys are down to the last four months. It's crazy hard to believe. Um, September, which kicks off next weekend, is a really big study. How are we in September of 2020 already? I have no idea. If somebody could tell me how this year is going so quickly, I have like, I, it's just like that. Um, Anyways, we will be uh, looking at bast fibers and pet fibers. This is a big, big study. So for those who are participating in the 51 yarns, just go easy on yourself and make sure you're using the Ravelry group and the Slack channel as sort of support as you work through these, these fibers. Um, for many, these are gonna be quite challenging fibers to spin. So please use us, tag me, ask questions. It was a big study for me. Um, I, I actually was starting to feel like a little bit like, I probably should have divided up September and we should have done those fibers over a couple of months, but because we were fitting the study into 24 months, which is a huge amount of time, um, it just ended up that those two ended up together. So 
uh, fair warning. We also have in the How I Spin content, um, so that's the co-executive producers and the attentive spinners. We've got uh, coming up um, my breed and color study. So what I did with the breed and color study for the next couple of months. So that'll be really exciting. And we've got a bonus um, How I Spin coming out as well that will be made public for everybody for you guys to see. It's so good to see everybody in the chat. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as you know, the live streams happen every week. They are for patrons. Even for just a dollar a month, you can um, subscribe and participate in the community and in the weekly live streams. Um, people are pretty incredible. So thank you to everybody who's here. Welcome to new viewers and returning viewers. Um, I appreciate that you guys give the show a chance. So for August, tell us about your biggest accomplishment in spinning. I am going to give another Frisian bat away because I've realized I'm down to the last few and I would like to uh, move them along and move them into lovely homes. So in the interest of accessibility, I know that a lot of people aren't able to access um, Ravelry for various reasons. And um, my primary concern with, with people not being able to access is from like an accessibility health standpoint. And um, I was trying to figure out how to do the monthly, give, the, the monthly giveaway so that you didn't have to go to Ravelry if you didn't want to. And I was trying to make it all complicated and I was just overly complicating it in my mind. And um, Mike was like, just use YouTube. <laughs> I was like, right. So if you would like to comment below on this YouTube video, um, I will compile all of the comments at the end of the month and I'll just kind of number them. Uh, I have a, Mike actually being the mathematician that he is, had a great way of figuring out how to do it. Cause I was like, oh, but this and oh, but this. He was like, no, 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 just, just do it this way and you'll be fine. So it'll still be a random number. So if you would like to um, enter in the episode thread, the link is in the live chat right now. So if you would like to enter in the episode thread on Ravelry, the link is there. If you, and if you're part of the Ravelry group, please feel free to do that. Or you can just comment below. And what we're looking for for August is to tell us about your biggest accomplishment in spinning. Not necessarily your favorite spin, but your biggest accomplishment. What have you made or what have you done that's been really quite incredible? All right, breed and color study. Now I have to find it. <laughs> Give me a sec. Here we go. Awesome. So yesterday we went uh, out to a local to us lake, and it's a um, it's you're not allowed to have anything motorized on the lake. So there is some fishing. It is a stocked lake. It's up in Mission, British Columbia. For those who know this area of the world, it's about 45 minutes from us, and. Um, we took the paddleboard. So Mike very kindly gifted the paddleboard to me. Oh, it's getting up to like probably five years ago now. May it's not quite six. Nora was Nora even born? I feel like Nora was a thing. I feel like she was sort of like a year old. No, she was five months old. That's what it was. She was five months old. Anyways, it was our wedding anniversary, and I was having quite a tough time postpartum with Nora. Um, I had a little, um, I had, I had some, I won't say a little bit, there is no little bit. I had some postpartum, um, with a postpartum depression with Nora and, um, I think it was actually postpartum overwhelm. I think that was actually what was going on. There was a lot going on in our life at that time. And, um, for our wedding anniversary that year, Mike gave me a paddleboard. I'd always wanted one and we had rented them a few times. So yesterday, uh, we took it up to, uh, um, Raleigh Lake, like I said, and, um, this was the first time, so our kids are six and eight, just turned six and eight. This is the first time that they both were able to stand and paddle on their own. So we were both on the board, like Mike here is here, he's kneeling. Um, and uh, um, we were there sort of more as like to balance the board. And of course, every time we moved, the kids were like, don't move it, we're gonna fall off. We never fell off once, which was pretty awesome. And the kids actually did it themselves, which is so super stinking cool. So uh, I thought I would share that with you because I know you guys know um, that we love being outside and we love the outdoors. And um, Mike and I had to take turns taking the kids out, but we have never been out for this long. We were out on the water for five hours straight and the kids were just paddling and paddling and paddling and they would take turns. So I had to take a picture and share that with you guys. So thank you for, for uh, listening. 
It is super fun, Elizabeth. And one of the things that I really love about paddleboarding is the fact that um, you you can you can do it in any way, shape, or form. So you don't have to be you don't have to stand. You can kneel. Um, you can sit. You can relax back and just kind of gently paddle and use a kayak paddle. It's a very accessible thing for many different people in many different stages of life. And I have to tell you guys before we get into breed and color, I have to tell you. So. I'm sitting there and I'll tell you about it later, but I was spinning and um, the kids all of a sudden are like, and we've just been reading this amazing series of books called um, um, Land of Stories. If you have kids or teenagers, get the Land of Stories by Chris Colfer. You have to read them. They're amazing. You'll love them too. They're kind of Harry Potter-esque. And um, anyway, so I'm sitting there and there's a gander in Land of Stories. There's a goose, okay? I don't want to say anything more because it'll ruin the stories, but there's a goose. So we've been reading these books. We're into book five now and um, there's this goose. And so <laughs> all of a sudden the kids are like, Nora's like nudging me and she's like, mama, mama, mama. And she's like pushing on me. I'm like, yeah, Nora, what? Like, what is it? And I, I was just in the middle of something. And I, and so I stopped the wheel and I looked up and there's a pet goose walking down the beach and got into the water with its owners. They got into their kayaks and they paddled around the lake for like a good two hours with this pet goose. So the, it just like made the kids day. <laughs> like the kids were just like, this is the most amazing thing ever. So this is our breed and color studies. This is, we're doing Charolais right now until the end of December. And um, Tamar finished all of her studies. I think it's all of her study, her final skein for the breed and color study. So I had shared the first part of her study last week on the podcast, and she's got her second skein here photographed next to her first skein. So um, this is 356 yards. 3.3 ounces of 20 wraps per inch single spun supported long draw with the bat split in five lengthwise for stripey color repeats. It was slightly fulled and snapped to finish. This was one, this one was much more stop and go than my initial three ply. My experience with singles with Charole is that very little twist is required to make a balanced singles. So I had to stop frequently to redistribute and check ply back despite going, uh, b despite using lower ratios. I love this yarn more as a singles. It's softer and has more of a halo spun that way. Side note, you have to love the coiling chaos of a singles yarn before you wash and finish it. It's like magic, happy spinning all. Yes. So, uh, Tamar makes a really great point about this fiber. So years ago, not years ago, in 2019, in the spring, um, I had spun Katrina's Fiber Club for May of 2019, and I spun my Charolais as singles. And this fiber, if you are comfortable spinning singles, this fiber spins as singles absolutely beautiful, beautifully. It folds beautifully. Um, it makes a gorgeous singles. Like Tamar said, you have to um, uh, really check your singles as you're spinning. Um, and make sure that you're spinning, um, that you've got a consistent plyback test, like she says. But not a lot of uh, spinning is needed. Sorry, not a lot of twist is needed. And you can just create this gorgeous yarn with this slight halo. Um, and it's really quite amazing. So my Charolais that I did years ago, uh, or I keep saying years ago, but I feel like 2019 was so long ago that maybe that's why I feel this way. <laughs> um, so I had spun my Charolais at that time for, for this fiber club as a singles um, because Becca actually, who I think is here today in the chat, she had actually suggested doing it that way. And so these were my singles at the time and I had spun the gradient bat that way and left it as a singles. And then um, I pulled it out this past week as part of the Braden Color Study. And I decided to um, chain ply it to thicken it up. And I put it with some Cascade 220 and I knit a hat. <laughs> um, I was so obsessed with the pattern that I knit it like overnight. So I stayed up super late on Wednesday night, which I shouldn't have done. And I knit it up. And I will say that chain plying this yarn and knitting it, it was still lovely. I have this little teeny tiny bit left. This is all I have left um, of my 
my my skein of, of chain plied charolais. I will say that knitting it as a uh, three ply, it felt thick, it felt bouncy and springy. Um, it has sort of a, a ever so slightly toothy nature to it. It just doesn't, um, it's still, it's next to the skin soft for most people, um, but I think for some it would feel a little bit, um, a little bit toothy, but it's spongy and springy. I liked it as a singles better, but it served a purpose to chain ply it and to get it out of my stash and get it knit up. Um, it did work really well with the Cascade 220 and they worked well together in terms of knitting weight and knitting gauge. They're both very light, they're both very airy. And I knit my hat up on um, the brim I did on 4.4 millimeter needles, US size six. And the body of the toque I did on 4.5 millimeter needles. And like I said, this is all I had left. So a word about the pattern, this was Alaska um, by Camille Descote, uh, Descote. Des Des Cote, yeah, um, she's from Montreal. She's a Canadian based designer. I've heard a lot of things about this toque. So this is the Alaska toque, like I said, and it's meant to sort of go through um, a gradient um, of color changes to sort of create that sort of Northern Lights um, uh, Arctic sky. And unfortunately, because of the way that my, I spun up my gradient, it didn't move through as quickly as I was hoping to. So I was hoping that more of that gorgeous blue would be in the trees before I transitioned to the, uh, the the decreases in the brim. And I was sort of thinking if I ran out of yarn in the body of the toque, I would just use the Cascade 220 for the palm. And that's kind of not what ended up happening. Um, so it, it ended up transitioning a little bit slower. It's still really pretty, I'm still really happy with it. Um, but the pattern itself, I think the reason why there's been some discussion about the chart and about uh, the complexity of the chart is because it is random. Like there's no, it's not like um, knitting color work diamonds or knitting color work, um, um, like a repeatable color work pattern where you've got um, stitches following a, a very specific pattern. And so I can see on fingering weight yarn, which is what the pattern calls for, and it's six or seven chart repeats around, I can see that it would be a little bit labor intensive. That said, Brenda Dane, who used to run the podcast um, Cast On, which for those who've been in the knitting world for more than 15 years, she's kind of like the mother of all knitting podcasts. She's the first one. Um, it was a very highly produced audio podcast. And um, it, was just, it was one of my favorite podcasts. I ran a few half marathons listening to her. And I think one of the things that she would talk about a lot was this ability to read our knitting. And she would really talk a lot about going down to the row below or even several rows below and figuring out based on the chart where you were in your knitting and being able to sort of put together what the stitches below were telling you, what the chart was telling you and what to work next. And I think sometimes with chart keepers, we have, you know, a, a knit, sorry, a knitting chart like this, I'll put it. Um, I, I don't want to change the camera around and my printer was really poor, but we have a, you know, a chart like this and we put, um, you know, a, a piece of, of, um, you know, a chart keeper and we go like this as we work our way up the chart. Right. And the thing is about doing that is you're obscuring the previous rows. So one of the tips that, uh, Brenda used to give was put your row keeper above so that you can see the chart up to this point and you're actually keeping track of your rows going upward so that your current row is sort of highlighted and then you go up to your next row and your next row rather than going from the bottom up and obscuring that row below. And I have to say that really helped with this pattern um, and it made it way more intuitive because um, as you're working your way up, uh, you're able to keep track of what's going on below. So if there was a, a gray here and a gray here and a gray here, and then um, your next row, you've got gray all the way across those stitches. You can kind of look at your pattern and look at your knitting and go, oh, okay, without actually having to count, I know that I need to start my next uh, gray stitches here uh, based on what I did on the row below. Does that make sense? 
So what do you do if the singles were a bit felted with each other after you finish them? Yeah, so that that's totally normal. Um, like you say, Christine, is that normal? Um, so with this skein, um, the, the singles were sort of a little bit sticky and they were sort of stuck together. And the nature of Charolais is that it is going to stick to each, each, itself a little bit. It's um, a little bit... Um, I was gonna say toothy, but not in a coarse sense, more just in a toothy, it wants to grab onto itself sense. So what I did was to chain ply, I had to, I had to, I, I, I couldn't um, chain ply from a skein of yarn or I didn't want to, I didn't want skein, I didn't want chain ply off of my umbrella swift. So what I did was I put the, the singles on the umbrella swift and I actually um, wound them onto a bobbin winder. And then I, I chain plied off of the, sorry, yeah, onto a bobbin, onto a weaving bobbin, on my bobbin winder, and then I chain plied off of that. So as they were coming off the umbrella swift, there were places where they were a little bit stuck together, but not overly so, um, and certainly what you would expect from a slightly fulled uh, singles. And because this yarn and this fiber is so bouncy and springy, the fact that it was a little bit fulled before and that I had gone from ice to hot to ice to hot to fold these singles, it didn't make any difference in chain plying. The yarn still came out as if it was fresh. So, oh, that's awesome, Tracy. She was the first podcaster I ever listened to. Me too, actually, because I was just getting into, so CBC Radio, Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation, they were just starting to do podcasts and they were just starting to release them. There was just starting to be RSS feeds and uh, we're talking like 2005, 2004 and uh, yeah I, I she had a few episodes up already by the time I found her and then I just kept listening it was actually my friend Chrissy over at snappy stitches uh, who has a, a vlog a, a video cast on YouTube um, if you don't follow her definitely make sure that you do uh, she uh, introduced me to her so and there was the other podcaster he was in Australia it was a man uh, what was his name he had a great podcast he was a teacher um, and I, I listened to all of his as well. Yeah, I love singles yarns, actually, Loreline. If you're thinking about it, it's a challenge. Yeah, Eve, I know a pet goose. It was so funny. Mike kept saying, there's a gander, there's a gander. It was really quite funny. Um, reading your knit knitting is such an important skill. It is, Deanna. And I think it's one of those things, for those who don't do it yet, um, I think reading your knitting is one of those things that if you're looking to take your knitting to the next level, that's something that you can do is to learn how to read your knitting. Um, yeah. And you're not distracted by the row you haven't gotten to yet. So true, Martha. Yes. Yeah. If you uh, put your chart keeper above and then you're not focusing too. That's a good point, actually, Martha, because then you're not focusing on um, the fact that you've got all these rows still to go like right now for... Um, pink velvet you know there's 30 some rows um 40 some 30 some rows of color work to get through and when you're working all the way around the yoke of a sweater it can feel very um overwhelming and uh you know you you want to enjoy it you know and enjoy the process not be quite so focused on um yeah on on the fact that you're you're not there yet that you haven't gotten there yet so, all right, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. We've got uh, our book club on the Slack channel, hashtag books, books, books. Um, we are currently deciding on which anti-racism book we want to study next. And we are also currently working on Emma for our Jane Austen book club. So uh, if you would like to be a part of our book club, please head over to the Slack channel, at, um, join at Patreon, join the Slack channel, and I will add you as quickly as possible. I should say, uh, this coming week, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm taking my mom and the kids camping for the week. So uh, if you message me or if you um, join, uh, welcome. <laughs> uh, if you, if there's anything, there might be a slight delay. I won't be out of cell service, but I might not be checking as regularly as I normally would because it's sort of um, the last working vacation, if you will. Oh, that's right. Sticks and Strings, David Reddy. Yes, that podcast was so great. And then he navigated away. And he used to do really complicated color work knitting. I remember him working on uh, some really complicated stuff. Emma is this Friday, so we're meeting to discuss Emma this coming Friday. Unfortunately, I will miss because um, I'll be away. Actually, I'll be driving the Coquihalla for those who know that road. Uh, and then we're still collecting titles for the anti-racist group. Thank you so much, Becca, for your work. 
um, on the book club. Uh, for those who don't realize um, or who haven't realized, Becca has sort of taken the lead with our book club and I just um, want to make sure that we're appreciating her and that we're thanking her for her uh, donation of time. So thank you so much, Becca. And if you don't know Becca yet, she is at Bethy40 and uh, she's invaluable to this community. So let's do <clears throat> let's do the Made with Love Along uh, giveaway. So I'll just go through this quickly and then we'll get into a couple more community things. Um, our Made with Love Along ran from uh, April 1st through to July 31st. It was an opportunity for us to make uh, together and to lift up others during a really challenging time as some of us were engaging in um, home learning and flattening the curve and distance um, work and working from home for the first time. And it was a very challenging time. I suspect this fall there will be challenges ahead as well um, as many of us experience second waves and third waves and so on, especially as we go into flu season. So we're kind of all in this together. Uh, I know they've put um, signs around my community that say, um, you know, we're in this together by staying apart, uh, and I, you know, I think I think there's some real, um, uh, you know, multi multi layers of wisdom there uh, that we could eke out. So Rebecca and I got together. This is at Rebby J. Uh, we got together this past week to chit chat about um, and and figure figure out uh, prizes and whatnot. So uh, let me go through them. I have four ounces of pin drafted roving to give away. It's my Shetland pin drafted roving that I've been working on and I just realized that I think I left it on the other side of the room. I've been spinning up mine for my Albini uh, cardigan. And uh, so the four ounces of pin drafted roving goes to Tamar at Second Zephyr. Congratulations Tamar because I know that you're here today. Um, I will be sending out another free gym bat um, hand carded by James, my son. Um, and this is going to go to Jill at Jill the Menace who is local to me So and I know from Sweet Georgie Yarns. So congratulations Jill. Uh, another Frisian bat is going to go to Mindy at DM Stowers. Uh, congratulations, Mindy. I will s And just send me your addresses, guys. Tomorrow I already have yours. Um, but for those I don't have addresses for, if you could send them to me. Uh, stitch markers, a set of stitch markers handmade by myself, which are actually right here. Um, I have two sets here. Um... So I've got some some sort of white one, whitish ones, cream, and then I've got some that have blue and, and sort of a copper color. Uh, one, one of those sets is going to go to Linda at Naughty 54 Knitter, and one set is going to go to Becca Bethy 40. So congratulations to Linda and Be Becca. Um, Becca is actually going to be sending out a carded bat uh, for this make-along, and that's going to go to Kelly at Tom Till. Congratulations to Kelly because she's actually in the... Uh, uh, in the chat as well. Uh, a Kiviet Cloud, this is going to be from Rebecca herself. Um, it's Kiviet from the Arctic, uh, from the Tundra. This is going to Sherry at Prairie Firebird. Another uh, Kiviet Cloud from Rebecca is going to Erica at Weave Madge, who's also uh, Weevolution.com, uh, which is awesome. Erica is a very, well, all of these people are very active members of our community. So um, many congratulations to everyone. Rebecca is also sponsoring um, two braids of Arctic berries from Katrina to be sent out. Um, so the first one is going to Hannah at Handmade Knits, H-A-N Made Knits. I love your username on Ravelry, Hannah. Uh, so you will get one braid of Arctic berries. You just need to get in touch with Rebecca, Rebby J. And the other one is going to Glenda Madstasher1. So congratulations, everyone. Glenda and Hannah, if you guys could get in touch with Rebecca at Rebby J. Congratulations to you guys and Sherry and Erica. If you guys could get in touch with Rebecca and share your addresses, that would be awesome. So many, many, many congratulations to everybody for the Made With Love Along. Thank you so much for participating. And um, thank you for just participating in the opportunity to lift each other up and to um, have an opportunity just to, to do something really positive through a really challenging time. Oh, that's so funny, Tracy. So she was saying about uh, uh, Celtic, um, about um, cast on. Uh, I was working graveyards on a crisis line at the time and she kept me entertained many a slow night. That's fantastic. She kept me, um, there was one time um, Brenda was talking about something and I wasn't really that interested. Uh, it was something that she was talking about. They were collecting maple syrup or something. And uh, it was just, you know, I was on a long run. I was at like 16K 
And all of a sudden, she just started being really funny. And she kind of went on one of her soliloquies that she, she used to go on and one of her kind of spoken soliloquies. And um, for whatever reason, she just caught me at the right moment where I was, it, it was really grueling. I was having such a tough time with the run. And she just had me in stitches. I was laughing so hard. And I just have always really appreciated her ability to do that. I'm just catching up with chat. Yeah, that's a, that's going back to the charts for a second, Mari. Really good point. This is one reason I love charts digitally on a laptop or a tablet where you can mark the PDF. So thin lines or highlights that you've done enables you to read more of your chart and to use it again for repeats. So that's a, and it saves the printing. So that's a really good point, Mari. I know you and Jess both do that. And um, I've always sort of thought, yeah, I need to do that. I don't have a tablet that's mine. Um, although I am going to re, I think I'm going to take my Nexus 7 back. And so it's quite old, but it would be perfect for that kind of stuff to access my Google Drive. I keep all of my patterns digitally. I don't actually print out patterns um, other than charts once in a while. And if it's a simple chart, I don't print it. And I keep them all organized in Google Drive. And then I can pull it up when I need to and when I want to. So, um, yeah. All right, hand spun weaving. So in the Ravelry group, we have a thread called hand spun weaving, weaving where we can share. And this captured me. I just thought it was so beautiful. It's also my colors. This is actually from Kelly um, at Tomatil, post number 198. She says, I, I thought I'd share my first hand spun weaving project, seven years in the making because of these skeins being seven plus years old. Warp and weft is all hand spun and the fibers were several different wools to 100% alpaca then dyed with plant dyes. The light green is a two ply Ile de France uh, spun long draw. First dyed with Osage, Osage and then dipped in indigo. Beautiful. Um, the medium blue green is Corydale and it was chain plied. First dyed with chestnut in Osage and then dipped in indigo. And there is a straight blue in there, and that's a two-ply merino dyed with indigo. The dark brown is a 100% two-ply alpaca spun worsted, which is um, natural colored. And the light brown is a two-ply alpaca Romney Cotswold blend spun on my Turkish spindle, semi-woolen, also the natural color. I warped and wove with absolutely zero planning, so I was quite happy to see how when this came out as an unintentional plaid. The whole thing is about 65 inches by 20 inches wide, and I, I think it'll make a lovely runner. I'm also quite happy with when none of my warps snapped, especially since I had not spun any of these thinking that they would end up being in a woven project. Gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful. Yeah, everybody's saying beautiful. I haven't used Knit Panion, Adobe Reader works for me. Oh, that's great, uh, Mari. I think, um, uh, Jess uses um, knit, pan knit Companion. Yeah, all great things. Awesome. Oh, Eve, you use Knit pa Companion. Okay, I'll have to talk to you about it. Now you guys are chatting about the, uh, the, the braids and the giveaway, which is fantastic. All right, so I'm gonna just change my cameras around here and we are gonna set up a little bit differently here. So this is the camcorder over here so that you guys can see the e-spinner. And um, I've got the webcam up here, so the color won't be as saturated as it is on the DSLR and on the camcorder, but that's okay. So I wanted to chat about this for a minute and you can sort of see a little bit of behind the scenes here with my my plywood and my my table and my <laughs> my keyboard. One day we will have a professional setup, one day. Uh, but in the meantime, it is all about just making together. So this, um, I actually have the pleasure of chatting with Catherine in a few uh, weeks, hopefully. Um, so this is Small Bird Workshop. Um, she is on the island, um, uh, local to me and, uh, and Glenda and Jill, and there's a whole bunch of us that are sort of down here uh, Mari is is in um, is local as well. We're all sort of in this greater uh, British Columbia kind of area. And when she Catherine was supposed to be at Fibers West in March, and of course it was cancelled. And so I um, I looked on her website, and actually it was through Glenda that I found her. And 
I ordered some of this pin drafted roving that's from the Okanagan. So lo again, local to me, it's an area here in British Columbia and it's 80% CVM, 20% mohair. And I actually ordered two 100 grams of this. So it came vacuum packed, which was just amazing. The other one is actually over there. I can see it. <clears throat> and, um, she very, very, very lightly, gently braided this. And I, I was sort of having a little bit of a, a moment, if you will, um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was sort of feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the tools and the projects that I've got going at this time, because I'm trying to get the Punta top finished on my Saxony, because I want to free that up for some other projects. Um, I've got some silk that I'm spinning. This is some Tassar uh, that I'm working on. Um, and I had, it's all done now, and I'll talk about it later, but I had this yarn here that I was working on, and I've got like just the Shetland, like I've just kind of got like my hand in a lot of different pots right now. But the e-spinner was empty and I was trying to figure out like what I could do. And, you know, I, I had been waxing poetic about the battery, but I hadn't really been using it this summer. And I've been working on other stuff and we have been home a lot. So I've been going to my treadle wheels quite a lot. And so the other day I had a few minutes and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to pull out my e-spinner and I'm just going to pull out some stuff from my stash and I'll just kind of see how it spins. And so I pulled this uh, CVM mohair out immediately and I sort of set up the e-spinner and um, I started spinning and you'll notice that my hands, I'm gonna move this so that you guys can see my hands a little bit better. I found that my hands on at quite a low speed on the e-spinner, I'm spinning at 12 o'clock um, I found that my hands just very naturally started to spin this um, with not a lot of twist, um, you know, just sort of running along the length of the fiber. Like I just sort of started spinning this way immediately and I didn't have to turn the speed up on the spinner very high. And it, I just sort of was like, what changed? Like what was different? Why, why was this just running so much smoother and so much nicer than it has than I sort of felt like it did when I first got it and what was the difference and you know I figured it out after spinning for a little while um, I changed the brake band so I had mentioned when we were unboxing that I wanted to change out the brake band immediately I don't I don't really like those plastic brake bands and so um Stead, slowly but said surely I've been changing my brake bands on my wheels over um, to some linen 100% linen <clears throat> that was um, that I had gotten from a local from my local weaving shop um, this is um, <clears throat> um, it's it's just a cone of uh, two nine where's the camera <laughs> two nine uh, um, uh, flax, just flax, line flax, just really, really straightforward weaving, weaving flax, like it's just nothing special. Um, these cones are quite expensive. They're about $21 Canadian. Um, and I have a flax break band on my Magicraft and I really, really like it. And it, I had switched it over from the recommendation of my friend Kim, who blogs over at Clada Fiber Arts. And I've really liked it. I like the tension. I like being able to adjust it really super well. And so I had switched over my e-spinner and then because I hadn't, because it was right at the time that I got my Lundrum Saxony, uh, I, I sort of didn't get going with a project on my e-spinner right away. And so, that was the difference. It's just made all the difference with the uptake, um, with the um, the feel of it. It's it feels smoother. The uptake doesn't feel so finicky and so fiddly. Um, I don't know if it's the natural fiber because this linen is undyed. So I don't know if it's the natural fiber on the wood bobbin that it just works a little bit better. It's just got a really nice smooth feel. I can adjust the uptake like adjust the brake and it's a little bit more um, uh, responsive but not in a in an unpleasant way like there's a there's a difference between being really responsive and being like finicky and it just feels smoother now and it feels like the spin is smoother 
Um, and so this spin, this long sort of, you know, stapled fiber mixed with the mohair, just this really lovely woolly kind of fiber is just spinning up absolutely beautifully as a result. And I'm really enjoying it. So yesterday at the beach, I was sitting on the, on the sand, just spinning it up. Brake band changes transform my spinning experience when I have bothered to do it or used other people's wheels. Absolutely, Becca. I, I can't believe what a difference uh, uh, a, a change in a brake band makes. And when you find the right brake band for the uh, wheel or for the, for, the, for the fiber or for the whatever it is that you're spinning, um, and you can't leave your brake bands on for year after year after year. You do need to change them out. And you do need to be cognizant of the fact that um, your brake bands do age. Um, they can break and uh, they need to be changed out. And on some of them, when you've got um, metal coils or you've got like on the Lendrum bobbins, it's a, uh, a hair tie, um, you need those lose their elasticity over time as well. And you need to be able, you need to change those out. Uh, and you need to put new ones on and um, you know they're quick fixes but you you have to be intentional about it and you've got to do it and I get lazy about doing it I, I'm the first to admit it and uh, I think that it's important to remind ourselves that our tools are just as important we spend a lot of money on our tools um, you know the other thing too that I wanted to comment on was um, I hadn't watched it yet but the uh, e-spinner discussion by Debbie held on the School of Sweet Georgia I uh, was watching it because I was, you know, catching up and just listening to some of what she was saying. And if you're interested in the School of Sweet Georgia, um, don't hesitate to click the affiliate link down below because I've got some workshops um, on the School of Sweet Georgia as well. And uh, she was talking about uh, the spinners, the e-spinners sort of and the place that they have in our tools and in our making. And that... Uh, you know, for some of us, they're maybe not the most intuitive things. Like they, they're not necessarily a, a good, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but you know, sometimes we feel like it's not sort of as much a part of the experience as treadling is. And, um, you know, I've talked on the podcast before about the fact that regardless of what your hands are doing and regardless of what's going on with your fiber supply and with your drafting hands, the spinner's turning and pulling, like no matter what. So it is sort of a little bit more mechanical. It is a little bit more of a mechanical experience. However, that said, um, you can get a lot of yarn spun very quickly and you can spin in some unconventional places. Like I was sitting on our beach blanket yesterday. I probably could have spun on my supported spindles, um, but I wanted to, you know, um, play around with this. I wanted to do a huge amount of spinning. I wanted to be able to use, um, to talk with the kids and to sort of be a little bit zoned out. And of course the kids were coming and going from the paddle board. So I was stopping and starting and um, I got a huge amount done. I probably spun about 50 grams and then the battery died. I didn't actually plug the, I didn't charge the battery enough before we left and the battery died. And I can't remember who it was in the, um, in the chat. Uh, somebody said that when the battery pack gets down to about three green lights, so I'll show that to you here. Uh, when the battery pack gets down to about three green lights, so on here, when it gets down to about three, right now it's at four, um, the spinner really starts to slow down and it doesn't matter what you're, um, uh, what you're spinning at in terms of what your speed is, uh, the spinner is just going to spin at the same speed um, because you kind of hit the max of what the battery pack can do. So I'm going to take this with us this week to uh, on our on our camping trip and um, I'm gonna see how it goes um, I we have a 12 volt converter in the trailer and I can um, plug it in the battery pack I mean and I can charge it up and I'm gonna see how that goes um, yeah so Martha made a really interesting comment just now and let me just find it I can't afford much but I, I've been really uh, tempted by the nano the electric the the electric e-wheel eel wheel the nano so the nano is about um it's about a hundred dollars canadian so it's about 80 60 80 dollars american and you know one of the things about that wheel because i have one uh one of the things about that wheel is it moves and it shifts quite a bit and so a lot of there's a lot of videos out there on youtube to sort of hack that and to help to fix that 
and I would really highly recommend looking into some of that and I would also look into some of the things that people have done to sort of modify that wheel because value for money that wheel is fantastic it doesn't draw enough to be able to use the battery pack and so some people have said let me just unplug the battery pack for just a second I'll show you what I mean there's on this battery pack this is the one that's on the Woolery that's um, linked uh, that is um, for the Ashford e-spinner it would I suspect it would work for for many of the um, um, e-spinners out there but do do look and do check um, you've got your output on the one side for your uh, e-spinner and then on the other side you've got a USB cable so one of the things that I was thinking about trying was plugging in my cell phone to charge while I'm using the, the, the Nano and having them plugged in at the same time. Because somebody had said on one of the YouTube videos, and I don't want to look for it right now, but he had a really long video about all the different things that he had done with his um, Nano to sort of make it more uh, usable for him. Because um, remember, with the with the e spinners, as with any wheel, you get what you pay for. Um, but again, I think that those little nanos um, they fill a niche for sure. Um, so I don't. I, I I think we we need to acknowledge that. Uh, the uh, he said by plugging in his cell phone. What, at, so caveat: the cell phone needs to be one hundred percent charged, otherwise it's going to draw too much uh, from the battery pack. Um, but that is enough to keep the battery pack turned on and keep the, the Nano running. So I haven't tried that personally, but if anybody has, feedback would be amazing. So that is my CVM Mohair, and it's been really fun to spin and contrast between this and the Romney Mohair that I spun for my Sparkle, card, for my Sparkle, Sparkle cardigan years ago. Um, that's been really fun to sort of contrast the two experiences because uh, um, very, very uh, similar in some ways, but quite different in others. So I'm just going to move this out of the way, and then we're going to talk about my meadow imitation quickly. Well, not quickly, but you, you know, we'll chat about it. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail about it, only because um, we've been chatting about this yarn quite a bit on the uh, podcast on the wool circle. And if you're interested in that, just um, check out Patreon. Um, I feel like this is really dark, but maybe it's just me because I've got a lot of light coming in. Um, so this is my meadow yarn. So it's all dyed. So this was my meadow imitation yarn. This is my uh, control card that I spun. So this was based on the fiber company's meadow. It's a 40% wool, 25% camelid, 20% silk, and a 15% flax. And so for mine, I did 40% BFL, 25% alpaca. 20% silk and 15% flax, toe flax. So waist flax and it's the coarser flax. And it's all still tied up for dyeing because I had to add extra ties in. And um, yeah, you can see the color up here a little bit better. It's not quite so dark. <clears throat> and you don't really need to see it on the, on the little camera. So I'll just um, talk about it up here. So, um, yeah, the color turned out beautifully. This is logwood, and you can see the color, sort of how it, I'll, I'll hold it this way so you can really see it. Um, you can see how the color, it's not as solid as it would have been if it was just BFL. Um, so I, I, pre, I mordanted it, I scoured it, mordanted um, with alum for the mordant, and I am so happy with how this turned out. I I only dyed it at 1% depth of shade. I was going to do 2%, but I just, I wanted something a little bit lighter. Um, I didn't want something quite, quite so dark. Um, and the, uh, just the, the overall yarn, it just, I just love how the dye, it's still a bit, um, uh, it's a, it's, it's not as soft as I had hoped post dyeing. Um, it's a little bit like it's a little bit um, sort of like I need I need to reskein it basically is what I'm saying. Um, but if I can show you under the product view and see if I can I can show it in in the light there. You see, it just got all of this like texture and color. So you can see the sheen, and you can see the flax in there and the texture. And um, my original knit swatch here is the original color of the yarn. So that was my original swatch on 3.75 millimeter needles. 
And the pattern that I'm going to knit is the Shoreline Vest by Carrie Bostick Hogue. And it's actually uh, 21 stitches over 4 inches. So I'm going to downsize my needles to 3.5. Or um, without getting into a whole bunch of sweater discussion right now, we can get into this after I start this project. I might actually leave it at 3.75 millimeter needles and uh, knit the smallest size, knowing that my gauge is a little bit bigger. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to figure that out. Um, I don't have a ton of yardage to do a ton of um, sampling, but those were my singles and that was the yarn unwashed. And then this is the yarn post scouring, but actually I need to wash it again because I think that some of the scouring, I think it's still got some, some uh, cream of tartar on it. So that was the yarn post washing. But it's a little bit a little bit stuck together and I think it's still got some stuff on it so I need to rewash it so I was gonna say it looks like logwood it yep you were right Kelly it, it is logwood I was really torn I was sort of like do I do logwood or cochineal but the cochineal has sort of that that slightly um, reddish color um, and I've done logwood in the past um, I had actually knit the shoreline in logwood the first time round so my um, my original uh, um, sweater that I knit was was in logwood. Sorry, my my uh, necklace is all twisted around, and it's actually it was bugging me. <laughs> um, but I did it at two percent depth of shade. It was quite dark, and then I of course ripped it out, and I ended up uh, knitting a shawl out of that yarn instead, which I wear all the time. So I thought, well, let's see what it'll look like if it's a little bit lighter in color, a little bit not not quite as saturated, a, you know, 1% depth of shade instead. So I am going to save a little bit of this yarn and add it to my, my um, book here um, to keep track of sort of what happened with this yarn. So yeah, super fun. I love this yarn so much. And I was saying on the wool circle on this past Friday, it's episode 24, if you want to see me plying this yarn and talking a little bit more about it. Um, I was saying on the uh, wool circle that um, this is just completely reinvigorated me in terms of like the, uh, the yarns that I like to make and what I like to, what I want to make and, and just the passion for this, like, this is why I got into spinning in the first place was to make my own yarns and to do my own thing. And um, I think this has really reminded me of what I want to make and the yarns that I want to make. And so I've been looking through my stash and I've been finding um, stuff that I want to, to um, um, spin up and um, blends that I want to make and I've been looking on Ravelry at the yarn under the yarn tab at different blends that are out there I actually did look some more at the fiber company because they've got some awesome blends so one of them was um, uh, it was a, a wool um, wool massum and what was the third fiber I can't remember anyways um, I've got massum in my stash oh it was uh, mohair I've got Massim, I've got um, some Kid Mohair locks in my in my stash, and um, some BFL that matches the staple of the Massim. It's actually the same BFL that I used for this, and I'm just so excited about it, you know. And I just um, and I've got some Kiviet Cloud from Rebecca that I'm going to card up with um, some other fibers. That's another blend that I found. This is this is what really gets me going. So uh, I'm excited about that. The other thing that I've been working on is some organic pole work. So this was a study from our study last time uh, that we did through the beginning of the year. We were looking at organic pole work and I actually have this little bundle. I have, I have a pound of this stuff to spin up, but um, I've been sort of slowly using it in other stuff and I'm gonna continue to do that. But I did want to spin some of it just on its own to put with my organic pull worth from our study that we did. That's all. Those are all of the yarns that I did for our previous read and color study. And there's a couple of them hanging up there. I think um, a couple of the, they're all three ply yarns and they're all various different, um, some of them are traditional three ply, some of them are uh, chain plied, some of them are a gradient, anyways. They're all three ply. So this is going to be a three ply as well. And I would like to spin up enough. I'm just going to work on it in the background um, when I don't have another project going. Ha ha. Um, 
and eventually have enough yardage that I can put that three ply with some of those yarns and knit up a couple of shawls. So that's my plan. Did you use a tannin first as well because of the flax? I didn't. Um, I'm really getting into the idea of dyeing cellulose for knitting, for quilting lately. Oh, very cool, Kelly. Um, I didn't use a tannin. The only reason is because I don't have any. Uh, and I am not a dyer, as you guys know. I'm sort of just learning, and it's been a very slow um, uh, learning process for me because it's not one of those things I'm not set up for it. The kids are home right now. Uh, so um, I didn't really care because it's only 15% flax. If, if the the natural dye didn't take to the flax at all or if it washes out over time and leaves the natural flax color I'm okay with that um, I did pre mordant for both cellulose and protein fibers and I think if I was to do it again I would have only mordanted for sorry I scoured for both protein and cellulose so um, I used a little bit of soda ash and a little bit of cream of tartar and a little bit of centropole and I think if I were to do it again I would only do the cream of tartar and only scour for protein uh, because the flax in the simmering water like the 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 um, on the stove probably would have come clean enough anyways and I wasn't gonna and I wasn't too concerned about dyeing it anyhow so yeah, these are the things that I'm still kind of trying to figure out in my head and get more comfortable with. Your swatches are tiny. Have you have they ever led you astray? Yeah, so my stash my my swatches are um my biggest concern they haven't. My biggest concern with swatches is usually my stitch gauge. I don't worry too much about my row gauge. Um, so I generally cast on depending on the size of, size of needles, I generally cast on somewhere between uh, 33 and 35 33 and 36 stitches and then I do three stitches at either end for um, my that that garter stitch edge so that this swatch doesn't um, roll and then um, I do a couple of rows of garter stitch at the top and the bottom and actually if you are wondering this is something new that I've just started doing um, you see those stitches up there that are all uh, sorry that are let me just make sure it's not reflecting the light you see those stitches up at the top there that are sort of those random pearl stitches that's actually the size of the US needle so um, th with this it was US size I guess it's US size 5 is 3.75 millimeter needles I've been trying to learn um, and so I did five pearl pearl stitches um, to show that that's um, the size of needle if I ever lose this little tag Part of the reason why I do such, my, my, my swatches aren't tiny, but they're not that big. And part of the reason why I do that is because um, I don't find that they're particularly accurate anyways. And I find that they often, um, I don't really know my true, true gauge until I start knitting. Um, and so I often go back and will check my gauge after I've done three or four inches of the yoke or three or four if it's a bottom up sweater three or four inches from the bottom um, and I will check my gauge because I do check my gauge before and after watching washing my swatch so if my pre-washed swatch is I don't know 21 stitches and then post wash washing is 22 stitches when I'm knitting I if I'm a roughly 21 stitches I know that I'm on the right track does that make sense Oh, that's awesome, Bridget. So her daughter is a brand new spinner, and after becoming frustrated with the drop spindle, she tried her Nano, and it was an immediate success. We use a small portable cell phone charger. Great idea. I code my needle sizes with the stitches, too. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh, okay. So 3.75 is 5 millimeter, or is 5, uh, US size 5. Thanks, Christine. Yeah. I used to do yarn overs, um, and then... Uh, for the full sizes, but I actually found that it warped my swatches. So I stopped uh, doing that um, So yeah, I wonder if what other people have found I Think it's a great idea of needle size. Yeah, but gauge isn't well determined. No, it's so true Mari so one of the things that I have really found that I've had to do with my um, uh, knit swatches uh, is I use them as a um, I use them as a um, 
a, like a, a, um, a starting point. Um, they certainly do not uh, inform the entire uh, process. So pink velvet is almost done, but I did run into a little bit of a snafu. So this is pink velvet. Um, this is all the yarn that I have left. So this is probably about, I think it's about 50, about 60 grams, 50 grams. Um, it's not a ton. So what I did was um, I went into my local yarn shop because they, they carry chow gu needles. And um, unfortunately, she doesn't carry the, the interchangeable um, set because otherwise I would have bought, bought that from her. But um, I bought another, I, I'm running low on certain sizes of needles right now. Like I'm finding, I was saying to Marilyn, who's one of the, uh, she works in the shop. I was saying to her that I need an interchangeable set and I have a Chow Gu interchangeable set that's the small size, so it goes from 2.75s up to 4.5 millimeter needles, because those are the sizes that I use all the time because of my wrist, which I've talked about lots. What I need though is doubles of all of those. So I need like two of those Chow Gu sets. Like I have the one, but I need, I, like my ideal knitting needle uh, uh, interchangeable set would be two of all of those sizes. So from 2.75 millimeter, so US size, whatever that is, up to 4.5, so US size seven, two of each of those so that the pack, when you open it up, is each side has a set of those needles. So I ended up going, I ended up buying a second um, a pair of 3.5 millimeter needles because the, the, I just use these sizes, three, 3.5, 3.75 and four, I use pretty much for everything. And uh, because I had gotten to, and I put this on spare needles um, that are also 3.5s, but my Likey set from my other um, interchangeable set, it makes me realize how much I knit. You know, like I always say, oh no, I'm a spinner first and I spin, you know, I, I'm first a spinner, blah, blah, blah. But it makes me realize when I start going through my needles how much I knit. Like I, I don't really appreciate it when people say, um, wow, you knit a lot. I don't really realize like I don't appreciate that I do, if that makes sense. Um, so I got to uh, here on the on the first sleeve, and um, I've done seven seven decreases. I'm not following the pattern for the for the sleeves. I never do. Um, I find the sleeves either decrease too quickly or they don't decrease fast enough. And I just have worked out a, a, a formula for myself that works really well. So. Um, I started this sleeve and I got to here, and this is 11 inches from, from the yoke out. Um, it's about 11 inches, which, which hits me about here on my arm. And I, re, and I had run out of the, that current ball of yarn that I was working on. So I went to get the, the, the last couple of skeins of yarn that I had washed and repurposed from another um, sweater knit, which is why this sweater exists in the first place. And I realized that I was down to the last skein that I had skeined up, washed to be re-knit. And all I had was was this plus what's in this sleeve now. So what I decided to do was um, I, I balled it up and I started working on the second sleeve. So I, gra I, I picked up another set of needles. And the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because um, rather than sh shortening this sleeve and, and not knitting it to the length that I'm hoping to get, which is a full, full size sleeve, um, I don't think that I will. I think they'll end up being kind of more like bracelet length, which is fine. I, it's worth it when you're running low on yarn to start your second sleeve and catch them up and then work on them together. So what's going to end up happening is I'll work on this one. I, I'm, I'm, they're now at equal length. I'm going to weigh this and I'll keep knitting this sleeve. I'll weigh this, divide it in half. So if this is 50 grams that's left, I will keep knitting this sleeve and finish it off to 25 grams of this ball of yarn and then I'll finish off the other sleeve because I'll have 50, 25 grams and 25 grams for each sleeve to finish them off and Bob's your uncle. So, and it gets away from ripping and re-knitting and worrying about whether or not you have enough yarn. So for those who are newer, newer knitters, um, that's a really great um, way of doing it when you're running low on yarn and you're not sure that you have enough enough left, especially when you're working with your hand spun because sometimes when we're working with our hand spun, we only have a certain amount of yarn and that's it. So if you ball it up and weigh your ball and then 
Um, so you've done the body of your sweater, you've done your yoke, you've done the rest of your sweater. This is this works really well for sweaters where the sleeves are last. Um, and then you can figure out, um, you can take that, that remaining yarn, divide it in half in terms of how much that sleeve is going to weigh and then knit out to that length and then you can do your other your other sleeve and you know that you've got enough yarn. So just a just a tip. Instead of measuring what would you do what's T A A T? Um my swatches are yard large. Oh, that's cool, Rebecca Becca. So um my swatches are larger so the a few yarn overs in the corner aren't going anywhere near where I'm measuring. That's great, Becca. Two at a time. Uh, instead of measuring, could, you totally could do two at a time. Absolutely. I just don't like, um, I just tend to get into a rhythm and then I forget to go back to my other sleeve. <laughs> so we've got uh, queries and explorations after the podcast today. So I am going to sort of start to wrap up here. I'll show you the last project that I wanted to share with you. Pink Velvet is a pattern by Andrea Maori. And the other thing that I've been working on, I'm super excited about it, is my Poet. I finally got it going. So again I needed needles um, remember I had shared this with you this is a pattern by Nori uh, sorry Norland uh, I actually have ended up she's a new to me designer and there's actually a couple of patterns by her that I have ended up putting in my queue for those of you who are on Ravelry this is something that I use a lot is my queue um, and I'll, I'll link it in the sh in the um, in the uh, live chat here for you guys to look at my queue but there's a couple of her patterns that I have queued uh, one is her uh, Florence tank which I actually was very naughty girl I bought yarn for because I, I, I don't think that I'm gonna get a chance to spin yarn for it I've just got too many other projects going and it's um, I already bought the pattern and it's something I really want to knit so the Florence tank is not one that I want to knit by her and the another one is the Varma um, and it's uh, got this gorgeous lace pattern down the front. It's a short sleeved kind of uh, knit tee, knit in uh, fingering weight yarn. And another pattern by her, oh no, it was just those three, <laughs> just. Um, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about it the other night. I was like, wow, I, I have a, a lot of sweaters that I'm working on, a lot of garments. But you know, I wear them um, and I, um, I've been really, I've been very steadily clearing out um, non hand knit um, outerwear. So like, you know, sweatshirts, sweaters, um, commercial stuff that I don't wear. And um, some of these pullovers, like this one, for example, my pink velvet, it's so wearable. Like I pulled it on the other day and I would put it on right now, but I'm just um, cognizant of time for, for queries and explorations starting. Um, it's so wearable like dropping the kids off at school in the morning I'll just be able to pull it on and not think about it um, and I love that ability to just I, I'm really embracing that I've talked about that on the podcast before so this is um, a poet by Sari Norland like I said and this yarn is um, it's a commercial yarn as well the other one is Jameson Spindrift that's what I'm doing pink velvet in and this yarn is um, goldenrod. It's it was on sale year, uh, a number of years ago. I, I'm embarrassed to say it's been in my stash probably since 2015, 2014. Um, this is um, uh, Swan's Island Natural Co Colors Collections, and I think um, this yarn is still available. It's 100% organic merino, um, and this was I don't think that it's super wash I think this is or maybe it is I'm not sure they use a special super wash um, I, th I think it's actually 100% wool anyways they used goldenrod for the for the color so of course as you know this is my favorite color in the whole wide world um, and I finally got started on it because what happened when we were away was I cast on and I did the couple first couple of rows the setup rows and then I realized that my chart hadn't printed properly. So I got the chart printed and um, I got started on it. So that I've, I've done enough now that I've actually connected the front and it's um, um, knitting up really, really nicely. And this is the back. So you can see the, the lace is starting to really come to life and your sleeves are knit, thank goodness, stockinette. So the sleeves will, will steadily grow and um, this is a situation where I will probably knit the sleeves first 
uh, once I get there because um, it'll give me a bit of a break before I get into the body of lace. And if the sleeves are already done, then it'll kind of give me that motivation to finish the body because I'll just have to finish the body um, and the, the sweater will be completely done. So that is that. And again, it's being knit on 3.5 millimeter needles. There's a theme here. <laughs> so. Yeah. That is it, I think, for today. I am working with a yarn for Poet that is not the same gauge. Oh, okay. She's enjoying, Elizabeth is, oh, that's right, Elizabeth, because you were going to cast on the Poet as well at the same time. So um, the hardest thing is picking a size. Yeah. The photo sizes work well for, oh, sorry. Uh, I am working with the yarn for the Poet. So Elizabeth, for if you're not working with the same gauge, are you, um, have you, had to modify and change um, the the um, uh, the number of stitches that you cast on. Like, what did you do? Are you doing a different number of pattern repeats? Um, yeah, it's a complicated lace pattern. Then because you're doing something on both both uh, every single round, you have stuff to do. So for those who are newer knitters, um, if you're looking for an overall lace pattern on a pullover or a cardigan and you want to kind of delve into that there are other patterns out there that would probably be a little bit um simpler for your first time round uh but for those who are sort of you know wanting to go to the next level with your knitting the pat the, the chart is intuitive uh and it makes sense sort of where you're going as you work your way up the chart uh you just have to pay attention but i'm, I'm finding it's not too slow like this is just a couple of evenings of knitting it's not too bad so all right, I, I, I don't want to, but I need to say goodbye. Thank you so much for being here this week and thank you for um, uh, you know participating in a slightly longer stream. Thank you so much for your interaction and your participation, participation in the chat. This is our last live stream for August. Next week we are into September. So because of that, this, the uh, podcast, I've said this all summer, but next week is the weekend we are switching to live streams on Saturday mornings. Um, so this, this, it will be at the same time. It's just going to start at, on Saturdays. Uh, next week, there might not be show notes that come out before. Um, normally what I do for patrons for the live stream is the show notes and the links for the live stream are posted at 4 p.m. the day before. Because I'm going to be driving and getting home on Friday, it might come out a bit later. So just be warned that uh, the show is going to happen on Saturday morning next weekend. It will happen at 8.15 Pacific Daylight Time, barring anything changing, in which case I'll let you guys know. But the show notes and the links and everything will be posted a little bit later. So please just um, keep that in the back of your minds for next weekend. But we will be uh, switching to Saturdays starting next weekend, um, the first Saturday in September, which I think is... um. The fifth so and we will also have our q a group afterwards so uh queries and explorations will be afterwards next saturday and the reason for having two back to back um so quickly is only because um i needed uh, i i've got a couple of things on other weekends coming up in september that um, we're gonna um uh, conflict and of course we were away this month so it pushed queries and explorations by a week so thank you so much for um, understanding. Uh, oh, to answer my question, Elizabeth says, I'm just doing a larger size, but the dimensions will be smaller than what is showing. Oh, that's a great idea, Elizabeth. So then you're just paying attention to the length of your yoke so you know where to, where to change, where to separate. That's great. Very cool. I love it when people are modifying patterns because it's very empowering for others to hear what they're doing. All right. So thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Thank you for um, participating. If you're interested in learning more, please head over to patreon.com slash wellforpearls slash join and have a look. If you're confused about the tiers and where, where to pledge and what would fit for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, Rachel at wellforpearls.com. And um, even just a dollar a month uh, pledge gives you access to Wool and Spinning Radio, which is our monthly audio podcast. So that gives you access to the live streams 
and it gives you access to Wool and Spinning Radio. So, and I've got um, Catherine coming up on Wool and Spinning Radio of Small Bird Workshop, and we've also got a couple of other people coming up that um, have wonderful things to share with us and with our community. So thank you so much and have a wonderful week. I hope it's full of sunny, sunny goodness and lots of spinning wherever you are. And until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy dreaming. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.